let's have a look at integrating functions of time. So I've got a velocity time graph there. So a velocity time graph. Now, if we have a velocity time graph, what can we tell from the picture? The change in displacement, because displacement would be the integral of velocity. So it would be the integral from zero to four of our velocity function there. So that would be the change in displacement. Whereas the change in distance, we would have to break it up into above the axis and below the axis. So displacement is just like a straight out integral, whereas distance we have to consider area. Right? Because remember, in, in distance we don't care about the plus or minus. Same as when we do area, we don't care about the, the plus and minus, we, so we have to break it up. So if they want change in displacement, we can do a straight integral. If they want change in distance, we have to break it up into above and below. So the same thing will happen if we have an acceleration graph because the change in velocity, well, that would be the complete integral from zero to uh, four, but the change in speed, we would have to break it up into what's below and what's above. So derivative graphs, I mean, that's essentially what we're doing here. Okay, we're using motion, but it's drawing derivative graphs. So what sort of things are we looking at? So for our purposes, we're saying uh, displacement is like x, so our function. The first derivative is velocity. The second derivative is acceleration. But essentially, as I say, we're just drawing derivative graphs. So if we have a stationary point on the displacement graph, what will that mean for the other graphs? Well, then we must have an x-intercept on the velocity graph because the first derivative would be equal to zero. If there is an inflection point on the displacement graph, then we will get a stationary point on the velocity graph. Now, how do I know that? Because if you carry that through, if there's a stationary point on the velocity graph, then there must be an x-intercept on the acceleration graph. That's telling me the second derivative is equal to zero, hence why the inflection point creates this, because the second derivative is equal to zero. So the original graph, you see an inflection point, you know, on the velocity at that x value, obviously the y values, you know, will change, but at that x value, we'll have a stationary point, and on the acceleration graph, we'll have an, an x, well, actually, it'd be a t-intercept, wouldn't it? Not an x-intercept, because time would be our horizontal axis. So when the original one's increasing, that means the first derivative is positive. So we know the velocity graph will be above the axis. And if it's decreasing, we know the velocity graph will be below the axis. But if the original graph, the displacement graph, is concave up, well, if it's concave up, we know the second derivative is positive. So therefore, the first derivative must be increasing. Because in order to have got that derivative to be positive, it must have come from something that was increasing. So we see concave up, we know it's going to be increasing the velocity, but also the acceleration will be above the axis. Which means when it's concave down, the opposite's going to happen. We'll have decreasing with velocity and acceleration will be negative. All right, now the types of graphs. If the graph is a horizontal line, if we integrate a horizontal line, we will get an oblique line. Like a horizontal line would be y equals a constant. Integrate a constant, you'll get a constant times x. So it'll be some ob oblique line. If we differentiate it, it must just be the x-axis, or if we're talking about our velocity time graphs and what have you, the t-axis. Okay? Because when you differentiate the constant, you would get zero. If the original graph is an oblique line, so some line at an angle, it's not horizontal, what would happen? Well, we'd get a parabola when we integrate. Because if you were to integrate something times x, you will get something times x squared. But when we differentiate it, now we'll have a horizontal line. Um, if, say, the original graph was a parabola, well, when we integrate that, we'd get a cubic. And that cubic will end up inflecting at the turning point. That comes back to the last table that we looked at. And if we differentiate it, we'll get an oblique line. Okay, key things to remember. Integration is essentially area, but depending on what we're trying to find. So if we're talking about a velocity graph, total area is distance, total integral is displacement. 
And for acceleration, total area is speed. Total integral is velocity. Let's try one. So velocity of a particle is given by this particular function, a trig function, two minus four cos t, and v is measured in meters per second, t is in seconds. At what times is the particle at rest? So essentially it's just asking us where are the stationary points. So we know it's going to be when velocity equals zero. So we solve that little trig equation. We're only going between naught and two pi. So we're in first quadrant and fourth quadrant. And we end up with, there they are, pi on three and five pi on three. So okay, we now know when this particle stops. A pi of three seconds and again after five pi on three seconds. What would be the maximum velocity? The maximum velocity. Well, I'm not going to use calculus here because it's a trig function. And we know things about trig functions. So I can actually look at that trig function and get the answer straight away. Here's my working out. In reality, I'd probably just do it in my head and go, well, this is the answer. But remember, the, the amplitude of that cos function is four. So I know that cos function is going in between minus four and four. But we're adding two to the whole thing. So therefore, this function is going between minus two and six. So the maximum velocity must be six. So I don't need to use calculus on this to, to work it out. I mean, I could have, but maximum velocity is six meters per second. Now we're gonna draw the graph. So essentially a trig graph, as I was saying, amplitude is four, shifting up two units. We flipped it upside down because it was negative. Uh, period is two pi. I'll mark the divisions pi on two. So there's my axes. I'll just draw in a horizontal line at two because it's gonna wind around that particular line. Uh, it was a cosine function. Normally we would start a cosine function at the top of the amplitude. This one's been flipped, so we'll start at the bottom, but we've shifted it up as well. So we will end up plotting at negative two, and then we'll go up and down, and there's our graph. They must have been expecting us to do part two using calculus, because it's sort of the reverse. I mean, had you drawn this graph first, then you would have got the answer to part two a lot quicker. So I think they were actually expecting you to probably do it by calculus. It doesn't say, it's a lot quicker than just think of the, the picture. Calculate the total distance traveled from time equals zero to time equals pi. Now looking at that graph, remember they have asked for distance, so we have to break it up into above and below. That uh, T intercept, is at pi on three. You can work that one out by solving the equation. In fact, that's what we did in part i. So I know below the axis, so it's going to be the negative of naught to pi on three, but then it'll be the positive of pi on three to pi. So let's integrate those. Um, you'll notice I flipped the limits on the first one and got rid of the negative sign. Reason for doing that is because now I have pi on three on the bottom of both. It just saves one substitution because now when I subtract, I just subtract two lots of when I substitute in pi on three. Bit of calculator work. And, well, I always leave things in exact answers unless they tell me otherwise. Four root three plus two pi on three meters. That's where your physics teachers would go crazy if you gave them that answer. But that is the exact answer for the question. Here's a acceleration time graph they've given us for this one. Um, they've given us some conditions there, initially at rest and and so on. Write down the time at which the velocity of the particle is a maximum. This is where you really have to think about your calculus. Velocity is a maximum. So when will velocity be a maximum? And all we've got is the acceleration graph. Well, velocity I know is the integral of acceleration. So it's saying, when will that integral be the biggest? When will the answer be the biggest it could possibly be? What's going to happen at t equals 2? So remember, we're talking about the total integral now, not talking about areas. So clearly, once we get to t equals 2, that area is going to be the biggest it could be at anywhere from 0 to 2. But as soon as we go past 2, that integral is now going to be negative. So it's going to lower that value. So the maximum must have happened when t equals 2. Of course, the other way you could think about it. Uh, velocity. When's velocity going to be a maximum? Well, maximum will occur when its derivative is equal to zero. Well, when is acceleration equal to zero? Again, we can read off the graph, and there it is at t equals two. 
Like, however you choose to get it, but that's our answer. The velocity is a maximum when t equals two seconds. At what time during this interval is the particle furthest from the origin? Furthest from the origin. So it's now asking us, when is the displacement a maximum? What's the furthest away it's going to be? All right. Well, displacement is going to be a maximum when the velocity is equal to zero. But velocity is the integral of acceleration. So we now are looking for when is that integral equal to zero. That's what we're trying to solve. So looking at our picture, what we're saying is, well, when is the area above the axis the same as the area below the axis? Because then they would cancel each other out and you would get zero. So let's have a look at our picture. T equals four by symmetry. It's a lovely symmetric graph they've given us. So from t equals uh, naught to two would give us a positive value. By symmetry, from two to four would give us the negative same amount. And we'll have our answer. So it's gonna be furthest away from the origin after four seconds. Ooh, this graph's a little bit more interesting. We have some curves and what have you. It's a velocity time graph this time. So a velocity time graph, and they've given us some points there, and they've told us once we get past six seconds, the velocity is constant. Using the trapezoidal rule. Oh, what? We have to remember the trapezoidal rule? Yes, we have to remember the trapezoidal rule. Estimate the distance traveled between naught and four. You see, we can only estimate because we don't actually know the equation of a curve. But we have been given some points. So that gives us some information. Remember, trapezoidal rule, h on two, um, two times all the y values in the middle and y naught and y n. So I'll draw up a little table of values and it is a little table of values because I've only got three points, naught, naught, two, one, and four, five. Yeah, one times the n ones, two times the one in the middle. And so we end up with seven meters. So that's our estimate for the distance. The object is initially at the origin during which times is the displacement decreasing? Okay, we know it's gonna decrease when the derivative is less than zero. In other words, when the velocity is less than zero. If you look at the velocity time graph, we're saying, when is that graph below the axis is what it's basically saying, isn't it? So that's when t is greater than five. Estimate the time at which the object returns to the origin. When is displacement equal to zero? Well, displacement is the integral of velocity. So similar to the last one, but now we're talking about velocity and displacement. So once again, we're asking, when is the area above equal to the area below? Okay, well, there's our graph. Let's work this one out. Well, if you look at four to six, I can see that's nice and symmetric there. So I know those bits will cancel out. So I now want to know how far after six will I get the same area as naught to four? Now naught to four, our estimate was seven. And lovely, past six, we have a straight line. So we're just talking about a rectangle here. We wanna know when is the area of this rectangle equal to seven? Well, I know the height of the rectangle is five. So five times, I'll just call it A. Five A is equal to seven. So we end up with 1.4. But of course, that's after six. So about 7.4 seconds. About 7.4 seconds. Sketch the displacement time graph. Okay, there's velocity time. I will place it underneath. We're going to transfer the data down. First thing, I know the object's initially at the origin, so I'll plot that point in. We estimated that when t equals four, x was equal to seven. So I'll plot that point in. Remember the symmetry of the areas? So I know that at t equals six, it must be back at seven again. Area of that triangle is 2.5. So therefore, at c, it must be 2.5 further away, 9.5. We just worked out that it returns to zero when t is 7.4. So I'll plot that one in. Now, this is where I've got to do a little bit of guessing for a here at t equals two. But what I can see is that curve is steeper from two to four than it is from zero to two. Therefore, it must cover more distance going from two to four than it does zero to two. So I don't know exactly where it is, but I'll put it below halfway because I know it's gonna cover more distance. 
Now, after t equals 6, velocity is a constant. So if I integrate a constant, I know I get an oblique line. So I'm just going to join those two points up. I know that's a straight line. So I've got that bit. And it must go through these other ones. It's a curve. That's going to be my picture for the uh, displacement time graph. Here is a velocity time graph. Initially, it's at the origin. At what time is displacement a maximum? So again, displacement is a maximum when the area is most positive. Also, when velocity is equal to zero. So it's going to be t equals two. When does it return to the origin? So you can see similar sorts of questions. Ah, when is displacement equal to zero? When is the area above equal to the area below? I know from zero to one, that rectangle is going to have a value of two. I'm just going to assume that's symmetric. It looks symmetric. So I'm going to say those areas are the same. And so now I'm saying, when is that rectangle equal to two? So they'll cancel each other. We know the height of the rectangle is two. So it must have a width of one. Therefore, we're at four seconds. So T equals four. Draw a sketch of the acceleration. So there's velocity. I'll put acceleration underneath. So similar to the last one, let's get the key features that we know. We're going to differentiate a horizontal line. Differentiate a horizontal line, you get the axis. So all right, I know it's along the axis between those two points. It looks like a cubic to me. I'm just going to estimate it's a cubic. You know, when you're doing these sorts of things, they haven't given you a function. So just explain why you've done what you've done. If they can see your logic, then they know, okay, you are thinking about this problem. There's some rationale behind what you're doing. Well, differentiate a cube, I can get a parabola, so I'm just going to draw in a little parabola there. From five to six, I'm just guessing, because look at the picture, it looks the same shape. So I'm guessing that's part of a cubic as well. So therefore, I'm going to get a half of a parabola when I draw that one in. And so there's my acceleration time graph. <laughs> nice. <laughs> 